In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I hate to confess this, but if you asked me what I preached on any particular Sunday going back uh, several years, uh, what did you preach last time on this text, I would probably have a hard time telling you what I preached. Uh, but this Sunday, uh, this particular occasion, the baptism of our Lord, uh, sticks out to me more than any other Sunday. I can tell you several sermons. In fact, I will. Uh, you're getting several sermons. That's a, a prelude. Uh, but this Sunday connects with me in so many different ways. It's definitely my Epiphany Sunday. I think it's a reflection of how rich and how significant this story is and how truly it is a light bulb. A aha moment. It gives us an insight of what it means that God became flesh and dwelt among us. What it means for us, what it means for all of creation. So, most times when I reflect on this, I start with this question. Why would Jesus need to be baptized? Why would he demand to be baptized? This is the one who is without sin. This is the Son of God. And at that time, baptism was much different than it is now. It wasn't an initiation rite. It wasn't a sacrament. Uh, it was a little bit like the confession and absolution. It was a little bit like those scenes in the movie where the adulteress or adulterer or the murderer uh, takes that shower hoping it washes all those sins away. It was a purification rite. So why would Jesus go through it? Why was it so important to Jesus to be baptized? So the first time I remember preaching on this particular text was 15 years ago. It was two weeks to the day after that morning on Sunday, December 26, where I was on my way to church, checking my phone, and I heard news of the tsunami that ravaged the Indian Ocean and the, and the uh, surrounding areas. And for days and weeks, we heard horrific stories of loss, but also stories of incredible resilience and hope, of heroism. And when I read this, when I read this text, it provided me an enormous comfort to know that Jesus had entered these very same waters. That Jesus was there and therefore hope was pregnant in those waters, even amidst all of those horrific stories that were being told. Like a sponge, he'd absorb all that was in them, all that was in those waters, all of the humanity in those waters, and that we would know through that, that in a concrete way, that God was with us, that God was present not only in those waters at that particular moment, in that particular place, but that God was in those waters that caused so much loss, and that God was there in all of the messiness of our lives, all of the wholeness of our lives, the humanness of our lives, God was there. And therefore, hope is always there. Today's actually to the day, the 10th anniversary of the earthquake that shook Haiti, that changed Haiti forever. And it's definitely worth stopping a moment to acknowledge all of the loss. God was there. God was there in the loss. God was there in the temp camps. God was there as they tried to get clean water, as they were hungry, as they were fighting, and as they were healing, and as care came in the hands of so many people from around the world. And God is there in the rebuilding. Because when God is there, hope is there. Just as God has grafted God's self to the lands and people in Haiti and around the Indian Ocean and on both sides of the River Jordan, God is there in Australia and uh, as they combat those wildfires and with the people of Puerto Rico suffering again the earthquakes that continue to shake their island nation, God is there and therefore hope 
is there. On another particular occasion for Jesus' baptism, we were baptizing a child, and their parents came up to me a few days before, and they asked, uh, they handed a vial to me, and it was a vial of water from the River Jordan, and they asked, could we mingle this water with the water that you're going to baptize our daughter with? We've always wanted uh, G uh, 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 our child to be baptized in the same waters that Jesus was baptized, and I looked at that little, uh, that little container of water. And I thought about it, I used my uh, very mediocre knowledge of meteorology and science, uh, and I thought about all of the processes of water, of how it evaporates, and how it moves, and then it falls somewhere else, and then evaporates again, and moves, and falls somewhere else. And I realized that in every rain shower, there is as much of Jesus present as there was in that little vial of water at a particular place in the River Jordan. That God has marinated God's self so fully with all of creation that we can't escape it. God is in all creation. That the incarnation mingled God's presence, not just in a particular time and place, but in all creation, in all time, comes through in this reading. A few years later, this occasion occurred uh, a few months after I'd been visiting my sister-in-law and brother-in-law up in Cleveland, and they'd arranged uh, a boat tour uh, of Cleveland on the Cuyahoga River. And part of that boat tour was telling the story of the Cuyahoga River, which was once uh, one of the most polluted rivers uh, in America. It was so polluted uh, that in 1969 it caught fire. Uh, and that became one of the visuals that became the catalyst uh, for our environmental movement here uh, in the United States. Uh, and as I thought about that, and as I prepared on that particular Sunday, it struck me. All of the muck that was in the River Jordan, all of the sins of all those who were still gathered around Jesus at that day, hoping uh, that to be washed clean of all the things that they were embarrassed about or ashamed about, things done, things left undone, uh, things that pulled them from the temple, from God, was they thought about all of the brokenness, all of that was washed into that water. Uh, and if there were tangible, uh, tangible pollutants associated with all of that brokenness, all of those sins, one match, and that Jordan would have been in flames. Jesus enters into the fullness of it. He gets into that filthy water, filled with all of the things that we do to one another, all the things uh, that we're embarrassed or ashamed about, all of the things we'd rather not talk about. Jesus was in there, and every one of them pressed against his body. Uh, like uh, very few phenomena that we have, when we get into water, we can feel almost every pore. Uh, pressed against by water. Uh, and Jesus entered that fully. Like a sponge, he absorbed all of those things that we'd rather not talk about. All of them. And he went underwater. And they washed over him. And he took them in. And when he came out of water, something amazing happened. He absorbed all of those sins as he came out of the water. And I really like the versions uh, that this is a very public event, uh, that, 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 that God's voice is heard by everyone. Uh, the skies open up, and the Spirit descends, and his voice says not just to Jesus, but to all of those gathered around, to all of us gathered here, to all humanity, this is my child, my beloved whom I am well pleased, with whom I am well pleased, which is all also translated, and I like this one a little better, with whom I delight. Think that about yourself. This is my child, my beloved, with whom I delight. They say maybe even in a more accurate uh, translation, with whom I have chosen. Say that to yourself. My child, my beloved, with whom I delight, whom I have chosen. And these re words reverberate not just for Jesus to hear, for those gathered around, uh, but for all of us to know deep down in us and to trust 
That is our truth. Even as we are enveloped by our mistakes, our missteps, our regrets, things left undone, God says to you, you are my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, with whom I delight, whom I have chosen. A few years back, this Sunday uh, occurred uh, after the previous summer I had visited the actual uh, uh, site of Jesus' baptism. I had been to the River Jordan. Uh, and it's talked about in Scripture uh, that it's one of the more modest water courses, to say the least. Uh, but when you visit there, uh, it's no Shenandoah or James or Rappahannock River. Uh, it's a kind of a glorified stream. And it's kind of muddy. It's not the most beautiful place. But there's something beautiful in the fact that this story goes from manger to glorified stream. A muddy, glorified stream. It's part of the incarnation. Jesus isn't just an ambassador of God uh, coming on a goodwill tour, staying in a five-star hotel, visiting a few sites, and then getting quickly swept back to the airport. God is in the fullness of our lives. God is in everything. And for all those that feel like God's stretched arms don't reach to them, this story is about that. God came to throw God's, God's arms around all people, to claim all of God's children, especially those who feel for any reason outside that embrace are beloved. That any condition, whether it be fear of war, whether it be natural disaster, whether it be poverty, whether it be sinfulness, whether it be brokenness, God's arms extend all the way around you. And that's part of our story. I know this feels a little bit more like a triptych through sermons past uh, than a fresh sermon, but I do believe there's a lot going on right now. There's a lot going on in our world and in this moment. And this is, at least for me, such an important aha moment, an epiphany moment, where I see a glimpse of the fullness of what it means that God entered our lives, that hope entered every moment of our lives. And now, in baptism, we become the sponge. We become the sponge, and we take on the fullness of Christ who took on our fullness. I believe that in baptism, we not only claim all of these truths that we've talked about, but we become the sponge. We absorb the God who came into our lives and promised to never leave us alone. We claim our identity as God's child, God's beloved with whom God is well pleased, with whom God delights, and, and, whom God has chosen. And in baptism, we leave a mystery of what's going to take place, of what happens in baptism, but we also acknowledge what's already taken place. That spirit of adoption, that unconditional love, and we do that with our lives. When we affirm our faith in the words of those baptismal covenant promises, we realize that God has chosen us to live meaningful lives, to be that hope, that presence. What God has brought into the waters, he asks us to personify, to live out, to be God's hands and feet, to be God's hope in the broken times. The waters get